All right, welcome everybody to the, um, I think I figured this out, 689th meeting of the Poetry Society of South Carolina. Um, I looked at the, uh, I looked at my book to see what we were doing 100 years ago this month, and it was a meeting with Lancelot Harris, who was uh, head of the English department at the College of Charleston, giving a speech. Um, so I'm excited to, uh, to, be here tonight. I think that this may well, you know, fingers crossed, you never know with COVID, but this may well be our last Zoom only meeting. Uh, hopefully, we will be back in person for the remainder of our season, uh, March, April, and May at the Library Society. Of course, we will still Zoom those so anyone any, anywhere can attend. Um, uh, this is our membership drive month. Uh, that was the focus of my newsletter for February, and it's so far kind of panning out. We've got about uh, 10 new members since, since February and since the start of the membership drive, and very happy about that. And if you know, you know, keep in mind, if you know somebody who you think might be interested in joining the Poetry Society, it's one of the biggest bargains on the face of the earth and um, send them our way. And um, we would love to have more people in our organization. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was that we now have a merchandise store. I put that in the chat. Um, I can put that in again. Let's see. Um, it got kind of buried. But um, so we now are selling t-shirts and coffee mugs and things like that on our store we we keep some of the pros we keep a little a bit of every sale and uh, so you'd help us and you would enjoy having our 102 year old logo on your coffee mug or t-shirt so um consider that check out the store it's really quite reasonably priced um and i want to thank tina for that uh, she's our recording secretary she's here tonight there you are, Tina B, um, for, for doing all that work and setting this thing up because it, it's, it's, I think it's really neat to, uh, to be able to have something that you can wear or enjoy uh, to tell the world you're part of the Poetry Society. And I guess that's all I've got. I'm gonna turn things over. This is, um, February is when we announce the winners of the fall contests. And I forgot, it's like 1200 bucks uh, being awarded, and um, Charles Watts, our contest chairman, is going to be announcing those winners right now. So take it away, Charles. Hey, hey, here I am, live and coming to you live from Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. We have a bunch of winners here, and we have actually a few double winners. So stay tuned. We'll start out with the Stephanie Ellen Seiler Memorial Prize. The winning poem was um, Happy Family by Brian Slusher, who I believe is here tonight. And uh, the comment from the judge, oh, by the way, the judges, the judges for this year's contests, this, this season's contests were Len Lawson, Ed Madden, and Malaika King Albrecht, all Carolina poem, poets and um, uh, they really did a fabulous job. Uh, the comment on uh, Brian's poem was, I really loved how happy family moved through time and space, even as it centered on a moment, a menu item, a memory. The way the food is more than food, is commodified desire, is memory, is nostalgia. The poem is both condensation and expansion and haunted by the wicked pun of the title. So there you go. And the honorable mentions for this, the people who were wrote damn fine poems were Anne Herlong Bodeman and Deborah Daniel. <clears throat> the second prize, the John Edward Johnson prize. The winning poem was <clears throat> The Blessing of the Animals by Brian Slusher. And the comment, comment from the uh, judge, and that was a different judge, by the way. The marriage of form and content in the blessing poem was perfect. There was something already playful and wonderful in the catalog of creatures, but the truly fantastic thing is the tension between control and wildness. 
the poem juxtaposes our desire to bless the creatures within the domesticated constraints of a Christian faith with what the animals might mean to us. The possibility for a wild, unconscious spiritual desire and the poet's, poet situations in this tension, situations this tension in the constraints, the golden chains, we might say, of the sonnet, which steadily corrals these images towards the wild turn at the end. And uh, so congratulations, double winner, Brian Slusher, honorable mentions for this particular category, Louise Weld and Danielle Verwers. <clears throat> The next prize, the Clyde Robinson Poetry Prize, the winning poem was Sunday Afternoon Walk, Ravenel Bridge, Danielle Burwers. I think I've heard that name before. Thank you. Congratulations, Danielle. Comment by the judge. This category was difficult. I was struck by the simple human story of the winner, placed at what has now become an iconic part of Charleston. Lots of these seem to think that the more stereotypes I throw in the poem, the more Charleston it is. I think it was partly because of that that I love the wicked wit of the Six Facts poem, and I also love that it was dedicated to Jim Lundy. There you go. And oh, I'm repeating myself. The honorable, honorable mention for this was Brian Slusher. The next category, the Marjorie E. Peel Prize, the winning poem was The Given Life by Louise Weld. You've heard her name mentioned before tonight. Comment by the judge. The language in this poem has its own pitch and sway, which immediately draws me in to sit a spell and ponder life as it arises. I deeply enjoy the speaker's voice and their observations about the world around them and the world within. The poet's choice of the Barry epigraph is perfect and the poem fully lives up to the quote. A lovely poem, honorable mentions, Danielle Verwers and Deborah Daniel. For the No Rhyme and Reason contest, the winning poem was plugged in by Alan Koshiwa. I think he's a first time winner, I'm not sure. Comment by the judge. What a fabulous job using a multitude of poetic devices like rhyme, hyperbole, and alliteration to move this poem wildly across the page. Using humor for social commentary has a long tradition, and this poem wields words with humor and insight. I'm still laughing about infants tweeting their grannies. Honorable mentions, Carol Frischman and Deborah Daniel. The Perception Prize, the winning poem was <clears throat> In the End, What is Redolent by Deborah Daniel. Comment by the judge. Of all the senses, our sense of smell is most closely connected to memory, and this poem does a beautiful job of engaging the reader's olfaction. I admire how the poet weaves such important and powerful details throughout the poem, such as the dying younger sister's ability to smell illness and the middle sister's brushing her youngest sister's hair with citrus detangler. Honorable mentions. Carol Frischman and Lawrence Rue. The DuBose and Dorothy Hayward Prize winning poem, The Pear Tree by Beth Dillenkoffer. Comment by the judge. The poem contains strong metaphors throughout with firm use of each. Depicting motherhood here from the here from the beagle to the tree to the speaker's own life is a profound challenge accomplished exceptionally. The ending secures the roots of the poem and the wisdom of age. It is all very well done. Honorable mention Ruth Nicholson. And let's see here. Two more to go. The Starkey Fife Memorial Prize winning poem Ally by Dan Leach. Comment by the judge. The poem creates a rhythm and form with a reliable quality that readers desire from poetry. The imagery and subtext create intensity that reveals the speaker's raw emotion utterly felt in the last line. It is a delightfully difficult poem to come back to, but we will. Honorable mention, Susan Craig. And finally, the Susan 
Walter Myers Summer Scholarship winning poet, Danielle Burwers. Congratulations, Danielle, another double winner. Comment by the judge. Danielle Burwers opened her submission with three short poems that are marvelous. Unmothered, Tropical Fish in a Single Wide, and Biochemistry. The tone is perfect, the stories are intriguing, but what stands out for me is her sophisticated use of sound in the vowels to build tension in each poem's lines. The fourth poem, Between Two Poles, continues that sonic effort. The final poem, What I Know of Glass, is quite interesting and a very good draft that's well worth a revision. <laughs> Overall, her poems show that the poet is very good and deserves the Myers Summer Scholarship. Congratulations, the honorable mention was Francis Pierce. Thank you all for, for contributing to our, uh, our literary tradition here at, uh, here at the Poetry Society of South Carolina. I'm now going to turn it over to John Luke Byrne, who is going to introduce our first reader tonight. Hello, everybody. I'm here to introduce Eugene Platt. Eugene Platt is a Charleston-born poet and writer with degrees from the University of South Carolina and Clar Clarion University of Pennsylvania, as well as a diploma in Anglo-Irish literature at Trinity College Dublin. He is the author of the novel St. Andrew's Parish and the poetry collection Summer Days with Daughter, and most recently Nuda Veritas from Revival Press, which are all available to purchase at Charleston's Buxton Books, um, which is next door to our usual meeting place at the Charleston Library Society if you are in town. Um, otherwise, you can go to his website, um, platwrites.com, and find links. Um, his work can be found in Poetry Ireland Review, Poet Lore, Southwestern Review, South Carolina Review, Crazy Horse, Montana Mouthful, Tinderbox, and a whole bunch more. Um, Eugene has served on the board of the Poetry Society, and as a citizen of the literary world, he never stops working. Um, I'm not sure if I first met Eugene at one of our society meetings or if it was when I was working at Buxton Books, but he is always quick to recommend a literary magazine to send work to, um, and he has always read your latest publication, and he has specific references, and he always does his homework. He is a voracious reader, and he always supports his local bookstore. He goes in regularly enough to leave an impression. And to call Eugene a local poet, a true Charleston poet, both sells him woefully short and also fits almost perfectly. Eugene and his poems have traveled the world from San Francisco to Dublin to Folly Beach, um, but his poems often find a way to wander back home. Um, in the poem, Ashley River from Nuda Veritas, he writes of our Charlestonian waterway it creates proportionately more nostalgia per mile than the Nile, as much as the Mississippi. And its banks are benignly shaded by ancient oaks, tall pines, and magnolias more fragrant than metaphors can convey. He writes of his home, of many of our homes, with a nostalgia that bleeds into the poems, with an appreciation that you can feel. Eugene's poems play and dance and sing and laugh and cry. And I am truly honored to introduce him tonight. So please join me in welcoming Eugene Platt. Uh, thank you, John. When it comes time for my memorial service about 40 years from now, I'd appreciate if you would uh, do the eulogy. I'm very gratified uh, to be here this evening and particularly uh, to be on the same program with a poet as accomplished as Dana Levin. Um, if my reading has any merit this evening, I'd like to dedicate it to my lovely niece, Penny, and her accomplished husband, Moss, who have zoomed in from Columbia. 
I'm only going to read uh, six poems, and I'll start with one titled Visitation Rights. Uh, since we've had some really severe winter weather recently, which uh, might remind one of the winters they have in upstate New York, uh, this poem came to mind, Visitation Rights. The winters of upstate New York are long, but never last till June. The snow which closed your school today, a school I've never seen, I'm sad to say. The snow shall melt and moisten the earth, promote the growth of renewed life in lovely shades of yellow, green, and white. One sun-filled morning sometime soon, allow yourself to awake without aching and see the first forsythia of spring and beneath budding trees, the tracks of a unicorn, a lot like you. Follow it to a happy place in your heart where families like ours never part. Way down here in South Carolina where snow and unicorns are rare, it's always winter without you. To cope with the soul soaking cold, I've learned to burn a bundle of oak and count the days until you come for the summer visit we await perennially. <clears throat> Next I'll read, The Day I Killed My Cat, which is inspired by a beautiful cat in Keats. This is a picture of Keats taken on the day that uh, Judith and I adopted him, rescued him from a shelter uh, shortly before Christmas, 2017. And he enriched our lives for three years before his untimely end. The day I killed my cat. The day I killed my cat, is too easy to remember, yet too hard to forget. A gnawing sense of guilt has sentenced me to second guess my sorry self forever. More than sorry, miss, I grieve this ginger kitty, this cute little bone cord chewing rescue, a feline Houdini who broke into my heart and made my house a mouseless castle. So, I am loath to mince my words and will not trivialize his demise of lies like he had to be put to sleep. The naked truth is otherwise. In his case, euthanasia was euthanism for societally sanctioned killing. And 16 weeks beyond the bridge, my complicity still makes me weepy. If only I could redo that moment of truth when the overworked bat said, he has suffered kidney failure, soon will be dead anyway. It would be humane to hasten his end. I'd say, no, I know him better than you. He's like a surrogate son, sleeps with me, and is only three. His plaintive cries could be more, could be less about pain than pitiful pleas to put away your fatal syringe. Rather than cringe, I would cite his thesis, story tolerance for discomfort, opine that he deserved even the off chance of recovery, of catching one last squirrel. Alas, that fleeting moment has passed, but the day I killed my cat has not ended. In the archives of memory, it's like an audio tape with automatic replay. Replay, replay. I think I can take these off now. <clears throat> it's a, uh... okay. Well, uh, the next poem is titled An Inauguration Day Lunch, which I wrote a little of a year ago on the day of the presidential inauguration. Uh, and literally, I was uh, just thinking more about lunch, I guess, than the inauguration. But uh, uh, 
Anyhow, there it is. It's a, uh, oh, I should say that uh, the poem was first published in an Irish uh, journal titled um, um, I'm sorry, having a senior moment. Um, drawn to the light press, uh, and it's added to all of a uh, out of me by nominating it for a pushcart prize and inauguration day lunch. With bacon left over from breakfast, a traditional BLT seems right or sort of light inauguration day lunch in the provinces far from presidential pomp. And so I proceed toasting twin slices of wholesome home wheat bread to hold together, I hope, a tasty diversity of disparate parts. I wash and slice an heirloom tomato for the tea, pull from the fridge a jar of mayonnaise and look for the lettuce, the central L, an essential ingredient of an authentic BLT, Rummaging through crisper drawers, I find withered parsley, nuts, cheese. Of course, none of these is needed like lettuce, green leaves I love. But damn it to hell, there is no L, the otherwise a bridgeable gap between the fading big red tea and the crispy true blue B. Hungry but resigned to reality, I bite into truncated DLT and turn on the tube in time to hear a colored priest beseech so earnestly a unity as elusive as lettuce. <clears throat> uh, the next poem was occasioned by a DNA test I took last year. Uh, I should say by the startling results of that DNA test which I think will become apparent if you hear the poem. Uh, I've written this in memory of the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. How I escaped the Holocaust. Until age 82, I never knew I was a half Jew. Until age 82, and seduced into producing a vial of saliva for trendy DNA testing, truly, I thought I was purely one of the unchosen. As a young American soldier after World War II wound down, I found myself stationed in Munich, the beautiful capital of Alpine Bavaria. Due to my newly discovered ethnicity, had I been born in that ancient city, I might have died in nearby Dachau or been boxcar to faraway Auschwitz to slave away day after day after day, subsisting on watery gruel or maggoty mush until it was my turn to be gassed and burned to fervor the Fuhrer's satanic final solution. Phew. All the born in 1939, the fateful year, the hateful despots, legions, dagged, peaceful Poland. I was born an ocean away, not in Munich or Paris or Amsterdam or any other European city where the lurking Gestapo could have pulled me from a playpen or snatched me from the street, beat me, arm banded me with the profane store of David reduce me to a tattooed number. Was I lucky to have been born too late to fight in that wretched war? As some might say consolingly, hell no. Knowing now this haunting half of my heritage, I just wish I had been one of the greatest generation. And I'll end with two short poems uh, inspired by my daughter when she was an infant. Uh, <clears throat> the first uh, sort of new life, I was inspired to write on the day of her birth when I saw her nursing in her mother's arms. And the last poem will be 
new priorities, uh, which was inspired on one of innumerable occasions when I would uh, check on her when she would be sleeping in her crib at night. New life. Gurgling at your fountain of youth, close to the heart whose beat was once your own. Even your coos speak the contentment of a new life and cured only by the sins of your fathers. But you bring hope even to them, dear daughter, and yours is like a second coming. New priorities. My preoccupation is no longer empires. I tiptoe in darkness to witness your blankets rise and fall. Then, bending over the slats of your crib that remain silent centuries through the night, I become reacquainted with a God I knew in my youth and say a wordless prayer of hope for the future, which is the future of all the world, for listening for the sweetest sound I have ever heard, your breathing. Thank you very much. And now I think we have Susan Finch Stevens to yes. introduce. I had to make I'm I had to make a mad dash to Mount Pleasant when uh, a FedEx truck knocked down a power line and wiped out the internet on the island. But I'm here, <laughs> and I am delighted to introduce Dana Levin tonight. Um, I had the privilege of being in her week long workshop at the Palm Beach Poetry Festival in January of 2020. And that's when I first asked her about the possibility of her reading for the Poetry Society. Um, little did we know at that time that our way of life was about to change drastically because of the pandemic. Uh, neither did I know that during this pandemic, Dana's writing would resonate even more deeply when I returned to it. I have come to appreciate her work as prophetic as well as poetic. She delves with keen honesty um, into the strengths and vulnerability of bodies, both personal and corporate, and unflinchingly illuminates the human condition and the world in which we live, all the while utilizing syntax that is deliciously complex and dreamlike. Dana's fifth big book of poetry, Now Do You Know Where You Are, is forthcoming this spring from Copper Canyon Press. Her poems and essays have appeared in numerous anthologies, journals, and magazines, and she has been the recipient of many fellowships and awards. She has served on faculty and is chair of the Creative Writing and Literature Department at the College of Santa Fe, and is currently the Distinguished Writer in Residence at Maryville University in St. Louis. Um, she has taught at other colleges and universities, including the MFA Program for Writers at Warren Wilson College. Um, additionally, I've heard her refer to herself as an itinerant poet and teacher in reference to her practice of teaching various workshops and seminars around the country. Um, I hope that after her reading tonight, she will tell us a little about her workshop tomorrow. I can tell you from experience that she is a gifted and generous workshop leader. Um, I would love to work, welcome her in person, but alas, she is traveling through cyberspace to be with us tonight. Uh, it brings to mind the following excerpt from her poem, Across the Sea, the opening poem in her book, Banana Palace. We'd been reading poetry about a prophetess, one of the human cave-bound time machines. She had traveled a long way through the four dimensions to be with us, from someone's mouth to someone's ear, someone's hand to tablet, papyrus, parchment, paper, the liquid crystal light of our computer screens, Liquid crystal light, they'd really called it that, 
the inventors at Marconi Wireless. Um, so now I present Dana Levin, whose work has been called phenomenological by the Boston Review and utterly her own and utterly riveting by the New Yorker. Welcome, Dana. Well, thank you, Susan. Hello, everybody. Susan, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And thank you so much for, um, you know, floating the idea of my coming here two years ago. Indeed, the, the Palm Beach Festival was the last thing I did in person before the pandemic hit. And um, Danielle, thank you so much for all of your help organizing this and um, getting me here. And I'm so sorry I'm not here in person. And I, I really hope I hope to come. I, I have a new boyfriend who's uh, uh, into history and architecture, and he really wanted to come to Charleston. <laughs> um, so he's, he's ultra sad too. Um, I was here to read um, at the College of um, Charleston. That's what it's called, yes. The College of Charleston. Oh gosh, not, was that 2018 maybe? And I really enjoyed my visit to the city and I was really looking forward to coming back. So I hope, I hope I can come. Um, thank you um, for being here. G Eugene, thank you for that beautiful reading and that poem about your discovery through ancestry is just amazing. I mean, just amazing. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna read primarily from my new book. I only have a copy of a galley um, but this is generally what the book cover is going to look like. And I don't know if you can see that, but it's called Now Do You Know Where You Are? And the background image I'm, I want to tell you about because I feel like it matters. It's um, a close up from a wind rose, which is how sailors used to navigate. Um, and um, it has all of these winds like north wind, west wind, you know, the, in the four directions. Um, and then the designer put this kind of post-it thing, you know, with a tack on it, which I really love. I love how this looks like a roulette wheel. <laughs> um, I love its wheel-like properties um, and, um, and sort of wheel of fortune and wheel of fate, but also how do you navigate? And this book, Now Do You Know Where You Are, is about the last six years. And I have to tell you, I often do not know where I am, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, this country has gone through tremendous change over the last six years. I feel like we have been firmly launched into the 21st century, whether we like it or not. And um, it's a really uh, fraught time. There's a lot of energy inside of it. Um, and while all of this was happening collectively, I moved, I left Santa Fe, New Mexico after 19 years and moved to St. Louis um, for a job. I had never lived in the Midwest, even though my parents are from Chicago. I grew up in Southern California and I spent a good portion of my life in New England, but I had never lived, um, I mean, Missouri is right in the middle and I had never lived anywhere that had, that was still contending with its civil war history that had been a major United States capital, you know, state capital, even though it's not really the capital, but you get what I'm talking about, I hope. A major US city at one time, St. Louis, I think had the lar third largest population in the United States. Um, it's just so rich in history, really different from where I grew up. All of these changes, both the personal and the collective, it just whirled me around. And so this book is about that experience. So I'm gonna read um, pretty much in sequence, not all the poems obviously, but pretty much in the order of how they would come one after the other. So when you don't know where you are, now do you know where you are? Perhaps one thing you do is start at the source. And I really started thinking about my family background, my parents, my grandparents all came from Poland and Russia and they were Jews who were fleeing anti-Semitism and pogroms in uh, Russia and Poland. Um, and my father and my mother were both first generation Americans. 
And I really started thinking about my mother's uh, parents. So this poem is for them and it's called Immigrant Song. Bitter mother. Blue, dead rush of mothers, conceal your island, little star. Trains, hands, note on a thread, Poland's dish of salt. They said the orphan lands of America promise you a father. The ship's sorrows, broken daughter. The ocean's dark, dug out. Silent father. Rain, stars, sewage in the spill, hush the river. In your black boat, broken snake, you hid. You sailed for the merit lands of America, dumped your name in the black water. In the village, they pushed the rabbi to the wall. Someone blessed the hunter. Angry daughter. One says no, and the other says nothing at all. Chicago, I will live in your museums where Europe is a picture on the wall. Obedient child. I concealed my island, my little star. In my black boat, I hid. I hid in pictures on the wall. I said, I am here in America, your hero, your confusion, your disappointment after all. They said, how did you end up so bad in a country this good and tall? Thank you. Um, this next poem is in a very wonderful anthology called Bullets into Bells, uh, where um, lots of contemporary poets writing about gun violence, but then they had gun violence activists and survivors respond to the poems. And that was very incredible. So Bullets into Bells is a, is a wonderful anthology to read. This poem is called Instructions for Stopping. Say, oh, what I want you to do is I want you to say stop. Like just right now, say stop. Seriously. Yeah, feel it in your mouth, stop. You know, feel uh, the consonants and feel that P stop, right? Okay, excellent. <laughs> I will begin the poem. Say stop. Keep your lips pressed together after you say the P. Soon they'll try and pry your breath out. Whisper it three times in a row. Stop, stop, stop. In a hospital bed, like a curled up fish, someone's gulping at air. How should you apply your breath? List all of the people you would like to stop. Who offers love? Who terror? Write stop. Put a period at the end. Decide if it's a kiss or a bullet. Thank you, Danielle. Okay. I have a long poem that I'm not gonna read you all of, uh, called Two Autumns St. Louis. So um, I spent two autumns, I spent the autumn of 15 and 16 in um, St. Louis. And then I went back to Santa Fe when I was trying to decide if I could live in St. Louis full time. And ultimately I decided to, because frankly, living in two places at once is very expensive. And psychologically, I found out I was not suited. 
So, um, but this, this is a chronicle of my first two autumns. And as I mentioned before, it was just so eye-opening and uh, enlivening and confusing and incredible to come to St. Louis with all of that history. And it was also right after the events of Ferguson. So St. Louis's racial history and history with segregation was just in the forefront everywhere in just regular conversations with people in the news. Um, it was just incredibly fraught. Um, and so um, these poems are very much infused by that context and some of the things that I encountered and things that happened. Um, I'm gonna only read you three sections from this long poem. Um, there's a mention, we, we visited a historical cemetery where the groundskeeper was named Lambert. And he says like the airport, that's because the major airport is called Lambert Field. Um, there's a mention of Dred Scott, who of course was a um, slave who was suing for freedom in the 1850s while, while in free states. And um, the Supreme Court at the time uh, did not grant this and it was a precursor to the Civil War. And then um, the last poem refers to um, a Confederate statue that had been up in the park. And actually right after I finished the poem, it had been removed to a museum. Um, and the last thing I'll tell you is that there's a high bun in here. Do you guys know what a high bun is? The, the Japanese form of high bun. Um, for those of you who don't, it was uh, originated by Basho, one of the haiku masters of the 1700s, I think 17 or 17th century, can't remember which. Um, and it's a, it's a prose travel journey that's capped by a haiku. And the haiku is supposed to be sort of the spiritual or emotional encapsulation of the prose journey. And I got very interested in using the high bun for interior thinking journey. So that's a lot of context. Can you tell I'm a teacher? Forgive me. Two Autumns, St. Louis. This first uh, section is called Calvary Cemetery. Driving up Union to get there, all the yard signs saying, we must stop killing each other. A sign blaring, crispy snoot. An abandoned two story with the windows blown out, a cooler and a bucket on the porch roof outside a second story window. At Calvary Cemetery, groundskeeper Lambert, like the airport, what are you looking for? Tennessee Williams. Say it again. We asked to see the graves of Tennessee Williams, Dred Scott, and Kate Chopin. He obliged with the first two, but as to the third, he hadn't heard of her. On his own, he showed us four things. The hill where all the priests are buried. The large hill empty of markers. That's where the mass graves are. Cholera, diphtheria, real wrath of God stuff. We don't dig there ever a giant wasp nest hanging in the crook of a cross-shaped headstone. How close do you want to get? The tomb where that old St. Louisan with the two names is buried. How she had been in cotton and asked to be buried on the tallest hill overlooking the river so that she could watch the loading from on high. Later, Janet says, I can't find any record of that. Lucas Hunt. There had been copper siding on the entry to her tomb, but thieves took it and sold it for scrap. So too, the giant Lincoln penny medallion set in a nearby obelisk. Some groundskeeper had even seen the man prying it out, stashed it in his backpack and took off running. You can see the empty circle and where the crowbar went in. Janet says, so someone steals a giant penny, but other people leave real ones on the headstone of Dred Scott. The stones signify someone visited. Also flowers, beer, money, photographs, marijuana, toys, jewelry, clothes. People steal them or they're picked up every two weeks and thrown away. Animals that live at the cemetery, raccoons, coyotes, squirrels, hawks, foxes. Paul, who comes every day and stays for hours, pulling flowers from the trash and redistributing them amongst the dead. Fiery plastic flower adorning the stone of the playwright's sister, Rose. Later, 
talking about Ferguson over muscles at peacemakers, nothing but white people in the room. Missouri high bun. Gunning for deer, rabbit, turkey, squirrel, deals, got gold, fences. You treated your hunting dog better than your barn dog, better than your wife, help, workers, daughters, your black daughters and black sons, your French fur trapping, great grand, half blood, quarter blood, 1 16th, denied, 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 until a curious future daughter son spits and ships you off to ancestry.com. Was it a shock to you, the afterlife? where no one was a king in a white body. Forest Park. Friends, ghosts, pneumatophores, air roots, what Janet called cypress knees. They looked like knees. They each a bent leg fused shin to thigh, a cloak huddled hump in a crowd of clustered humps approaching the bank. I had not thought death had undone so many is what I thought as I came upon them all seeking succor, a lit arrival at Round Lake, which was really a pond and its fountain, which was really a lake like heaven, someone's idea of municipal joy. To rub the heels with cypress resin enabled one to walk on water, the symbolicum said, because it made the body light. An American idea that you could cross over from heavy chained to free. Who got what kinds of free? Who still believed? Round Lake ringed by cypress, a funerary tree, as in the maps the Buddhists drew of paradise, where you had to walk first among the carrion birds, pick through dog and corpse and the flesh between them in the graveyards of contested skin before you could reach the diamond center, a being of undifferentiated light. Saturday. St. Louis, 74 degrees. At Forest Park, you can find restored riparian habitats and steps to a buried river behind a locked gate. You can find bald eagles and butterfly weed and the angel of the spirit of the Confederacy, a statue dedicated 50 years after slaves were freed. An ecology. I'm new here from the desert west. All the license plates say, show me. Thanks for that. Um, I should tell you that this book is very formally restless. So that first section I read is pretty much prose, right? And then the second section, um, Let's move these papers. This is the high bun right here. So you can see the prose block and then that sort of haiku looking thing. And then um, the thing, um, the piece I just read um, is in verse. And I don't know if you could hear the changes in my register of speaking, but I really consider lineation to be almost like musical scoring. So it's gonna, de it's gonna determine how fast I read and and where I pause and how slow and everything. So if you ever end up picking up this book, you're gonna be like, whoa, man, there's stuff in here that looks like an essay. <laughs> you're gonna be right. And then there's stuff in here that is just straight up pro, uh, verse and everything in between. And I, I was scared actually when I was writing this book because of that, but hopefully it'll be okay. All right. So I am going to now read you um, a poem. Um, called Heroic Couplet. It references the poet Gregory Corso. If you know who that is, he was a beat poet. He's not as famous as Jack Kerouac or Allen Ginsberg, but he wrote a fantastic poem called Bomb. 
And it, it's a fold out in the book um, where if you fold it out, it looks like a mushroom cloud. Um, um, Corso, C-O-R-S-O. And this is a poem about anxiety. I don't know if you can relate to anxiety at this stage, especially over the last six years, but I've been having a lot of anxiety. So it also at the end references the drug clonopin. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. It is a medication for anxiety. Okay. This is called Heroic Couplet. A heroic couplet is actually a kind of poem. There is a little couplet at the bottom here. It is not exactly heroic. Heroic couplet. Out of range of North Korean missiles here in St. Louis, I looked on a map. Out of range, but not of the secondary ash cloud if the Yellowstone supervolcano explodes. Or the old nuclear waste dump meets underground landfill fire a couple of miles from the airport. Definitely in range of drought, storm, flood, famine, pandemic, riot, economic collapse, dirty bomb, mass shooting, rape, carjack, burglary, stroke, heart attack, cancer, mechanical failures of various kinds. And this is a line from Corso's poem, Bomb. Oh, bomb, in which all lovely things, moral and physical, anxiously participate. Thinking about Corso and Ginsburg being chased out of a meeting of an anti-nuke group at Oxford by audience members throwing shoes because Corso read, oh, bomb, I love you. I want to kiss your clank, eat your boom. I want to put a lollipop in thy furkle mouth. His poem saying, why fear bomb? It's just another kind of death, which will come for us all, generous friend. Hashtag we are toast. But I wanted to write about feeling lost before I woke up thinking about the nation. How finally, when? A week ago, eons ago, 10 executive orders ago, at the end of my session with Jensen, my beloved chiropractor body worker, I said I'd felt for months like someone had jammed a helmet and breastplate over me and I'd been trying ever since to get it off. He said, what if you're not supposed to take it off? What if you're supposed to find a sword to go with it? I felt the cogs of era turn and had to pop a clonopin. Okay. Are we doing okay? Okay, I know it's kind of weird to do this. <laughs> okay, I'm also keeping track of time here. Um, I'm going to read four more poems. So um, the next poem I'm going to read is a, is a simple poem that came from an experience I had with a friend who's a therapist. And I was sitting with her and I was just talking about how I was getting ready to move and I didn't know what the hell was going on in this country. And this was even pre-pandemic. A lot of these poems were written in, or started in 2017. And you can see it's another kind of variant high bun here. It's not exactly a high bun, but it's kind of got the spirit of the high bun. Um, and this is pretty much a verbatim rendition of, of what she took me through as I was talking to her. As I was talking to her, I made this, this gesture while I was talking about my life. And she said, oh, this poem is called How to Hold the Heavy Weight of Now. She said, you just made this gesture with your body and opened her arms as if she could barely fit them around an enormous ball. Make that shape again, she said, and so I did. Now let it change, she said, and I did. Slowly closing the space between my arms, fingertips converging until they touched. I watched my hands turn together, align pinky side to pinky side. I watched my palms open, pushing gently forward, leading my body forward. I watched them let a bird go. I watched my hands make an offering. It was just so amazing because she, I did this and she said, let it change. And I just started going like this. 
oh my God, it was, it's amazing to watch your body just do something without you having an intention and letting that be a communication. Um, I watched my hands make an offering, how to hold the heavy weight of now. Okay, so this next poem I wanna read you is a little, it's kind of weird, but the main reason I wanna write it is because it's the result of operations that I'm gonna talk about tomorrow in my workshop. Um, and, and what those operations have to do with is paying attention to what comes into the mind through the dream life or through daydreaming. I don't know about you, but sometimes I wake up with lines in my head or um, I'll, if I'm dozing off on the couch, I'll suddenly just hear a line and often they're quite strange. I always try to write them down. And then um, often with poetry, I start to collage them. Uh, and, and see if there's a relationship between them. I also pick words out of bags and I go through old journals and pick a snippet here and pick a snippet there. I grab stuff from failed poems and I just put them all in documents and start to see if lines and speak to each other. So this poem is full of those kinds of fragments. I guess it's sort of like a quilt quality to it. And then once I do that, I... Um, start to ask, is there a narrative in here? Is there a discovered story? Is there a story that these things are telling me? And in this case, there were, but it also dovetailed with an actual experience I had walking in a park. And since I'm showing you how things look, this is how it looks. Okay, January garden. Woke up with the minute I let I love you, touch me. Trees sprouted from my hair. Woke up with Zeus fatigue. What ails the nation? Woke up with the soul, a balm, a lozenge, yet another pill-shaped thing. Woke up and recalled nothing. Took a walk in winter air in the January garden, no one on benches. And then remembered with a bolt how I had been titling a poem in my sleep. A little less day after day, bomb after bomb. And just as I remembered, I passed a young woman at a picnic table writing in a journal. And she held, so help me, a pen shaped like a bone. And I heard the poem, each of us by nature a killer, each of us by nature picking something to practice mercy on. Okay, two more. I'm gonna read one poem from my last book, Banana Palace. And it's because the last poem I'm gonna to read to you, which is in the new book, responds directly to this poem, which was something this new book is doing. I don't know if it's because I'm finally over 50 and suddenly I'm looking at the past and the past is speaking to me in new ways, but um, I'm not sure. But this poem from Banana Palace is called Watching the Sea Go. And it kind of looks like ocean current, you know, like if you're standing on the beach and the way the fingers of the sea kind of come up and recede. So that's, that's what this poem is doing. Um, and it was about being in Mendocino, California, one of my very favorite places in the world, and taking these 30 second videos of the ocean while standing at the ocean. And then standing at the ocean on a cliff, watching these 30 second videos of what I just saw in real life. And after a while I thought, what are you doing? This is a very odd compulsion. And so this poem became a way of trying to answer the question, why are you doing this? Watching the sea go. 30 seconds of yellow lichen, 30 seconds of coil and surge, fern and froth, 30 seconds of salt, rock, fog, spray. Clouds moving slowly to the left, a door in a rock through which you could see another rock laved by the weedy tide. Like filming breathing, 30 seconds of tidal drag, 
fingering the smaller stones down the black beach. What color was that, aquamarine? Starfish spread their salmon-colored hands. I stood and I shot them. I stood and I watched them right after I shot them, 30 seconds of smashed sea while the real sea thrashed and heaved. They were the most boring movies ever made. I wanted to mount them together and press play. 30 seconds of waves colliding. Kelp with its open attitudes, seals riding the swells, curved in a row just under the water. The sea over and over before it's over. Okay, last poem. One of the last things I did to this manuscript was remove every poem about the pandemic. Um, and yet there were still mentions of the pandemic and in some pretty significant ways in poems that recounted events of 2017. Um, and I just think sometimes uh, when you are an artist, the probabilities flow through and you find yourself interested in or, or communicating something that might actually come into the culture later. I'm not saying I'm an oracle, I'm just saying that suddenly there were conversations about pandemic all around me um, in various ways. And they come in, they come into certain poems that were started in 2017. So I removed all the pandemic poems and mostly because they were all written at the very beginning of the pandemic. And as we now know, oh, it's so very different, isn't it? having to endure this now for, for two years and moving out of initial lockdown and everything, everything that has been happening. And I just thought that those first initial poems were incomplete. And I, I just didn't feel uh, comfortable putting them in this book, but there was one poem that I wrote that I loved. And at the very last minute, I put it in. I put it into the book so much at the last minute, it's not even in the gallery. <laughs> That's gone out to reviewers. So there will be a surprise for anybody who gets the finished book. So this poem is called Into the Next Eden. One of the things I was supposed to do was go back to Mendocino, the location of the poem I just read to you, in um, May of 2020. And then lockdown happened and I couldn't go and I haven't been back and I am going this May. I am going with my mask and my vaccine, I am going. Um, but this is about sadness, the sadness of not being able to go there and just where we are. It's a little bit longer than some of the poems I've read you. This is the last one, thank you so much for listening. Into the next Eden. I was supposed to go back to the sea, but plague prevented me. In a city by a river, no ship could take me, and planes, well, I stayed home for days with weekend drives to see my love, who didn't live with me. Night cranks up its float of stars, they inch and tarry. I was supposed to go back to the sea, but nature prevented me. It said, sit right down and let me clear the air. The sudden blue of the natural sky after years behind the smoke of money. Mother nature who had had it with us. That was my theory. So economical how she laid us and all our wrecking low. In another world, I'd perched on petrified lava, watching the sea go. I wanted to snatch each bit I saw and secure it in a book of glass. A rock in tide. Someone on the opposite cliff smoking. A schooner cloud, its reflection appearing. In a book transparent and indestructible. Would the book even make it into the next Eden? 
I watched as a plant watches, rooted and waving in wind. One of those scrubby plants you can't believe blooms from a cliff. Sturdy miracle, flexible and porous so change can get in. The sea never stopped happening. It unfurled over and over its massive rose. Love and death. Love and death. Love and death. Beating the cliff down to a nub. I was supposed to go back to the sea, and so I've come. Standing again inside my mind on Big River Beach. There, river tide and ocean tide push and marry. Seals swim up the river's finger for as long as there's salt. Standing again as I stood that day, watching a mother, a baby against her breasts facing out. Eyes round, mouth round as an O. It's the first time she's seeing the sea, the mother said when she saw me watching. The ocean wind blew our long hair straight back. We stood as flags pitched in sand, staking the human claim of being alive, of seeing the sea, the baby looking and looking. And then a thing like joy. Yes, did I know it? This open drinking in on her round face as if she were seeing again something novel and lost. I thought of the reincarnational memory waking up inside her, how some things you are happy to see again when you return like the sea. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana. That was uh, one of the best readings we've had in uh, recent memory. Oh. I, I just really bowled over. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. I would like to hear a few minutes worth of a description of your workshop tomorrow. And there is a link from the chat if people are interested in signing up. Um, tell us about it. Sure. Um, we'll meet as 10 to, from 10 to 12. I will give a very short talk. I've timed it. It is 24 minutes. Um, and it's about um, poetry and the unconscious. It's about reverie and divination and dream and how the, those processes, kind of like the poem I read, um, January Garden, how those processes can come in, help you if you're stuck with something you're working on, um, just bring in a different aspect of your mind if you're used to writing very narratively or from your conscious analytical mind. Um, so we'll talk about the uses of um, the unconscious and the associational properties. In my talk, I'll talk about a poem by Charles Simic. I'll talk about a poem by Slovenian poet Tomasz Szalaman. I'll spend quite a bit of time on a poem by Jean Valentine. Um, we'll even look at a dream record from a patient of a Jungian, of a, of a Jungian therapist. Um, I'll talk about one of my own poems um, from my third book. And then um, after that, 24 minutes, um, uh, any, we can talk about it, but we will run, we'll roll into generative exercises that are just meant to get, get you moving into some material um, that kind of bypasses your, your analytical mind. So that's what we'll do tomorrow. And I, I, hope, I hope you come. Well, I'm sure that a lot of people will come. Thank you um, for talking about it. Um, that's exciting. It's tomorrow, it's free too. Um, by the way, Charles Simic read for the Poetry Society way back when. Oh yeah, he was yeah. my teacher. He was, he was an early important teacher for me. Huh. He worked with me for nothing. I showed up at his office and said, work with me. And he just was like, he tried to make me take like 15 other classes by other people at the University of New Hampshire because I wasn't even a student. And then um, I said, but 
what if I want to work with you? And he just went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the most amazing development of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's neat. I, there, I've been um, kind of thinking about how we would do a family tree of the Poetry Society of the people who have read for us and all the members and uh, the, the, uh, the tentacles and the, the interweaving and just be a uh, of mind boggling, just how interconnected all this has been over the last hundred years. Wow. So um, anyway, I wanna thank you. We will um, wrap this up. I wanna thank Eugene uh, Platt for his wonderful reading to start us off the, uh, the warm up or the opener. Um, I'm glad you, you, the day has finally come. You could read, uh, he's been anticipating this for a long time and um, and I'm sorry that we couldn't, boy, I, I wish we could have done this in person. Uh, I think you would have, uh, it, I think one thing that's really missing for me about Zoom is that you don't hear our reactions as you read. You don't, you don't hear the gasps and the, you know, whatever. And, um, and so that's a whole different uh, dimension that reading in person is missing uh, in, in Zoom, unfortunately, but uh, maybe we'll have you back in, uh, in a couple of years and, uh, and you, you will read, <laughs> I hope. I would, I, I would love to come. And, and I just wanna say that when I read, I keep it on gallery because I wanna see your faces. You know what I mean? Like I, mm -hmm. I wanna know that I wanna have that sense because I agree with you, Jim, it's, it's hard sometimes. Yeah, well, this has been one unremitting nightmare. Uh, <laughs> And, um, you know, it just, every step of the way, I kept thinking, well, it's going to be over soon. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not even guessing anymore. I know. But uh, it's very promising right now, at least. Or that, I agree. That, that we're on the, we're on the uh, home stretch of this, this ordeal. I agree. So, um, all right. And also congratulations to all the winners of the contests um, and uh, the multiple winners like Danielle Furwers um, and, uh, well, gosh, who won? Brian Slusher, of course. He, well, he's always a multiple winner. And, um, but, you know, that's a big deal. Also, keep in mind that our um, submission period is open for the next round of, of uh, contests. Uh, you have until the 15th including, I guess, up to midnight of the 15th. So there's, there's many days left uh, to get your poems in and, uh, and to be judged. And maybe you will walk away with some money uh, come May. Um, and don't forget to pre-order Dana's new book, which I dropped the link a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's another uh, disadvantage of reading by Zoom. You don't get to sign books afterwards. <laughs> well, actually, I will tell you that Left Bank Books, uh, my independent bookstore here, um, you can order through them and ask for a signed copy. And then I'm going to go into the bookstore and sign copies. Um, and then they'll ship you a signed copy. Um, yep. They told me they were going to create like a page for it, but I don't know if it's up yet. I'll let Danielle know when that happens. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. Well, um, I think that will end the formal uh, meeting and I'm going to stop the recording and then we can uh, chat. You don't have to go, you don't have to leave right away if you don't want to. So um, thanks again, everybody for being here. Thanks to our poets, Dana and Eugene. Thanks to uh, the winners of the contest or congratulations rather. And also thanks to Charles and John for being so instrumental in bringing these Zooms to us. Um, every month. And, um, and also Susan Finch Stevens, you did something heroic tonight <laughs> to, uh, to make it work for your introduction. And I'm glad that, uh, that that worked out. I don't know how we would have done it without you. So um, I'm I'll hoping make... it'll be up and running for the uh, <laughs> seminar tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yes. And Susan, thank you so much. It's so lovely to see you again. And well, you know, it's wonderful to see you. And I hope that we'll be able to welcome you in person sometime in the future. <laughs> I, I, I look forward to it. All righty, I'm gonna stop the recording. Oh, Eugene's got his cat too now. <laughs> Everybody's pets are coming.